Wichita Liberty TV, featuring host Bob Weeks. Local politics without the spin. Interviews with nationally respected economists. Hear directly from Kansas conservatives about what matters to you. It's individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. Wichita Liberty TV. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Wichita and Kansas government and public affairs. We're broadcast on Great Plains Television, channel 26.1, also its companion website, kgpt26.com. Some of you may know me from my blog, that's the Voice for Liberty at wichitaliberty.org. The motto there is individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and economic freedom in Wichita and Kansas. If you'd like to learn more about the issues covered today or to contact me, well, just please visit wichitaliberty.org, subscribe to the email newsletter, like the Voice for Liberty on Facebook, and do follow me, Bob Weeks, on Twitter. Well, some citizen activists and Wichita City Council members believe that a single $500 campaign contribution from a corporation has a corrupting influence. But stacking dozens of the same $500 contributions from executive and spouses of the same corporation? That's not a problem, they say. Here's what happened. On December 1, 2015, the Wichita City Council considered an ordinance regarding campaign finance for city elections. A Wichita Eagle article on the topic started with, A proposed change in city ordinance would allow corporations, labor unions, and political action committees to have a greater influence on Wichita politics. For years, city elections have remained insulated from the power of these groups, unlike national and state elections, because Wichita Ordinance specifically forbids them from contributing to local campaigns. Now, the city believed the proposed action was necessary to comply with recent court rulings. And under the proposed ordinance, which was passed by the council, corporations, labor unions, and political action committees, they would be able to make a single campaign contribution per election cycle of up to $500. That's the same limit as for individuals. Well, during the council meeting, citizens testified as to the terrible consequences should the council pass this ordinance. Here are a few excerpts taken from the official minutes of the meeting. One person said, Citizens United has unleashed Frankenstein monsters purchasing our government with their pocket money. Another said, Corruption and conflicts of interest have become institutionalized and what city legal counsel suggests will sell the council and the city of Wichita to the highest bidder. Yet another person stated, according to a lengthy report last week by the Pew Research Center, across party lines, people are distrustful and concerned about big money in politics. Yet another person told the council that big money does not donate. It invests and buys democracy. And she stated she is asking the city council to keep big money out of the city council elections. Another person stated the city has been independent and has a freedom from influence that the state and the nation do not enjoy. This person said you will then be under the thumb of people who want to control you, which is scary to those of them who are highly opposed to this situation and hopes that the council will think of them and how this vote will benefit them. And finally, one person stated that the League of Women Voters has studied campaign finance over the years at all three levels, and she stated they are currently involved in the study of money and politics, and their position currently reads that they want to improve the methods of financing political campaigns in order to ensure the public's right to know and to combat corruption and undue influence, which is their biggest concern. Well, so those were people testifying, and in its reporting after the meeting, the Wichita Eagle reported more concern, and its reporting stated, 
But those who opposed the measure said they were concerned about opening up local elections to party-affiliated groups like PACs and about transparency since PACs do not have to report their individual donors. Individuals should decide elections, not corporations, Fry said, the Eagle reported. That would be City Council Member Brian Fry, who represents West and Northwest Wichita. Well, then the Eagle continued. Several members of the public spoke against the changes. People in the shadows are going to be pulling your strings, said Russ Pataki. It's very worrisome what big money has done to state and national politics. The city has been independent of that, said Lynn Stephan to the council before the vote. You have a freedom from influence the state and nation don't enjoy. Okay, I think by now you get the picture. People are concerned about the corrupting influence of political campaign donations from corporations and political action committees. Citizens and the Wichita Eagle, they all believe that currently the city council is free from this influence. But the reality of city council campaign financing is different. Now, in my testimony at the December 1st meeting, I explained that there are a few corporations that stack campaign contributions in a way that circumvents prohibitions. Although I did not mention it at the meeting, sometimes campaign finance reporting laws allowed this to happen without disclosure until after relevant action had already taken place. To illustrate, here is a timeline of events involving just one company and its campaign contributions. So, in 2008 and 2009, executives of Key Construction Company and their spouses made six contributions to the Levanta Williams campaign, totaling $3,000. Then in 2010 and 11, executives of Key Construction and their spouses made eight contributions to the Carl Brewer campaign, totaling $4,000. Brewer was then Wichita mayor running for re-election in 2011. And also, executives of Key Construction and their spouses made eight contributions to the Jeff Longwell campaign, totaling $4,000. Well then, in 2012, the city of Wichita was preparing to build a new airport terminal with the cost of around $100 million. Key Construction Company, as well as Don Linger and Sons Construction, uh, were two bidders of the, to the contract. And there was controversy. Don Linger submitted a lower bid than Key, but it was alleged and contended that Donlinger's bid did not meet certain requirements uh, relating to minority participation in the contract. Okay, well, on January 24, 2012, the year the airport terminal is going to be built, executives of Key Construction and their spouses made six contributions to the James Clendenin campaign, totaling $3,000. Then we have April 2, 2012. On this day and the next, Executives of Key Construction and their spouses made eight contributions to the Jeff Longwell campaign for Sedgwick County Commission, totaling $4,000. At that time, Longwell was a Wichita City Council member. Then, on April 17th and the next day, executives of Key Construction and their spouses made eight contributions to the Levanta Williams campaign, totaling $4,000. Now, here's some fast-paced action. On July 16th of 2012, an executive of a Michigan construction company and his wife contributed $1,000 to Jeff Longwell's campaign for county commission. Why a Michigan construction company? Well, that company, Wallbridge, was par partnering with Key Construction to bid on the Wichita Airport Terminal contract. Then on the very next day, July 17, 2012, the Wichita City Council voted in favor of Key Construction and its partner Wallbridge on a dispute over the airport terminal contract, which added over $2 million to its cost. 
Brewer, Longwell, Williams, and Clendenin participated in the meeting and voted. Now, city documents that day stated the job of the council in this matter was to determine whether the staff who made the decision in favor of key construction abused their discretion or improperly applied the law. Then three days later, on July 20th, an additional $2,250 in contributions from Walbridge executives to the Jeff Longwell campaign for Sedgwick County Commission is reported. Now, all this is pretty blatant, isn't it? Especially when you have a city council member running for a different office, so a company makes contributions right before he votes on your contract, and again, right after he votes in favor of your company. Then finally, in January of 2013, Lavonna Williams and James Clendenin filed campaign finance reports for the calendar year 2012. That was the first opportunity we learned of the campaign contributions from key construction executives and their spouses during the entire year of 2012. And for Lavonna Williams, these key construction-related contributions were the only contributions she received for the entire year. James Clendenin had received contributions from key construction-related individuals and parties associated with one other company during the year. Okay, I know I've gone through a lot of data there, a lot of events, but I hope you see that there's a pattern. Key Construction uses its executives and their spouses to stack and bundle individual contributions, thereby bypassing the prohibition on campaign contributions from corporations. And as I've shown you, this has been going on for some time. And it is exactly the type of corrupting influence that citizens are worried about, including all of those who testified at the December 1 City Council meeting. This has been taking place right under their eyes if they knew how or cared to look for it. And Key Construction is not the only company to engage in this practice. Just to summarize, the Wichita City Council was charged to decide whether city officials had abused their discretion or improperly applied the law regarding the airport contract, that is. That sounds like a judicial responsibility. And how much confidence should we have in the justice of a decision if a majority of the judges have taken multiple campaign contributions from executives and their spouses of one of the parties? It doesn't matter which way these council members voted. They should not have participated in this matter. And it's not only the airport contract that Key Construction has benefited from. It has received millions in subsidies from the City Council. The Council has also voted to give at least one no-bid contract to Key Construction. That contract was later found to be overpriced. Padded, in other words, for the purpose of funneling excess profits to Key Construction. Yeah, Key Construction, the company that bundles and stacks campaign contributions to many city council members. Now, in some ways, it is understandable that citizens might not be aware of this campaign contribution stacking. The relevant campaign finance reports don't contain the names of contributors' employers. It takes a bit of investigation to uncover the linkage between contributors and the corporations that employ them. Now, for average citizens, we might consider that beyond the call of duty. But we should expect better from organizations like the League of Women Voters. And certainly, there is no excuse for the Wichita Eagle to miss or avoid things like this. And even worse, it is disgraceful that the Eagle would deny the problem, as it did in its November 23rd article I quoted above. So in summary, some citizen activists, most city council members too, believe that a single $500 campaign contribution from a corporation has a corrupting influence. But stacking dozens of the same $500 contributions from executive and spouses of the same corporation, well, they don't see a problem. 
Now, political campaign contributions are a form of speech and should not be regulated or, minimum, lightly regulated. What we need are pay-to-play laws which do regulate the linkage between campaign contributions and council member participation in matters that benefit donors. It's either that, or we need council members with sufficient character to recognize when they should refrain from voting on a matter. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. Well, let's stay on the topic of the city of Wichita for a moment because an unfolding episode is teaching us a lot about the nature of city government and government in general for that matter. You are probably aware that a division of Cargill that is headquartered in Wichita was considering a move to another city. And Cargill recently announced that it would stay in Wichita after all and build a new building somewhere in the city. The decision as to exactly where has not been made, at least as far as we know. But here's the learning opportunity about this episode. Now, the Wichita Eagle reports that part of what the city of Wichita is offering to Cargill as an inducement to stay in Wichita is a regulatory relief. In particular, Kerry Rangers reported, the city has offered smaller incentives to Cargill as well, including an ombudsman. Wichita Assistant City Manager and Director of Development Scott Rigby called the ombudsman something of a project manager. They'll just call one person, Rigby said of Cargill's dealings with the city. It's a way to eliminate a business trying to figure out, how do I get through the labyrinth of city processes? Rigby said the city has done this with other companies, such as Spirit Aerosystems and JR Custom Metal Products, and would do it for any company with an expansion or a project that needs streamlining. He said the city also is committed to work with the state and the Greater Wichita Partnership to create a talent recruitment position that could help Corgill and other employees, companies recruit employees at all levels. And the city has said it would offer a 15-day turnaround instead of the customary 30 days for plan review and permits, along with the 50% reduction in plan review, utility, and building permit fees. That's Kerry Rangers in the Wichita Eagle. Okay, so let me just repeat the highlights of what we learned. We learned there is a labyrinth of city processes. The city will offer streamlining to Cargill, as it has to two other companies. The city will process permits with a 15-day turnaround instead of the customary 30 days, and Cargill will receive a 50% reduction in fees. Now, all of this is an explicit admission that City of Wichita regulations are burdensome. If not, well, why would the city devote time and expense to help Cargill obtain relief from these regulations? And furthermore, why do we have these regulations? If the purpose of these regulations is to protect people from harm, well, then how can we relax or streamline them for the benefit of just a few companies? Wouldn't that then expose the people of Wichita to the harm the regulations purportedly prevent? Even worse, Cargill is a large company with, presumably, fleets of bureaucrats and lawyers trained to deal with burdensome government regulation. And these costs can be spread across a very large company. This means that Cargill can afford to overcome burdensome regulations. But what about the small companies that do not have fleets of bureaucrats and lawyers? Small companies that cannot spread the cost of burdensome regulation across a large volume of business. What will the city do for these companies? 
This is especially important right now because the spirit of entrepreneurship the city wants to cultivate is most commonly found in small and young companies, the type of companies that don't have fleets of bureaucrats and lawyers. Okay, so the city did say it would do for any company what it is going to do for Cargill, except how are companies supposed to know that to ask for regulatory relief, streamlining, and a discount on fees? And is it equitable to offer special companies special regulatory relief when it is not readily available for everybody? Last year, Kansas Policy Institute, in collaboration with the Hugo Wall School of Public Affairs at Wichita State University, they produced a report titled Business Perceptions of the Economic Impact of State and Local Government Regulations. On the city's offer of special treatment to one company, KPI Vice President and Policy Director James Franco commented, This bears out one of the key findings from a paper we did with WSU's Hugo Wall School. Companies want transparency and simplicity in the local regulatory environment. Businesses are not as concerned about the regulations themselves as they are in navigating what the city admits is a labyrinth of regulations and processes. He also said the regulatory process should be simplified for all businesses and not for just a few. Hopefully there is a realization that an ombudsman, or better yet a transparent, straightforward regulatory regime, should be available to anyone wanting to start or grow a business in Wichita. James Franco from Kansas Policy Institute. Yeah, so instead of the city offering regulatory relief on an as-needed, as-requested basis, well, why not simplify and streamline regulation for everyone? That seems to make a lot of sense. But if you were a city politician or a bureaucrat, well, that's really not in your best interest. If regulations are burdensome, and you, as a bureaucrat or office holder, can offer relief, well, then you have power. You become important. You have the ability to grant favors and to make people feel special. But if regulations were streamlined and reformed for everyone, as the city will do for Cargill, then bureaucrats and politicians would not be so powerful and important. But the people would be more free and prosperous. Think about the trade-off the city is making. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. People tell me all the time things like, Bob, the modern economy is so complicated that we, we must have complex regulations to make it work. They say that without government management of the economy, nothing would get done. But the reality is, is that as the world becomes more complex, the more impossible it becomes to manage. So, how do we get things done? How can we prosper? Well, the Competitive Enterprise Institute has made a movie illustrating the lessons of I, Pencil, an essay written in 1958 by Leonard E. Reed. And here is the video that they made. And you can learn more about this at ipencilmovie.org. This is the world we live in. If we weren't surrounded by it every day, if we didn't take it for granted, we'd be dumbstruck by its very intricacy and brilliance. This is an ordinary, familiar wooden pencil. You might think a pencil is simple, Chances are you've been using one since before you could even read or write. But just because it's familiar doesn't mean it's simple. 
In fact, it's complicated, elaborate, beautiful, elegant. Its very existence is too improbable for any one person to truly comprehend. These are the basic materials that go into a pencil, graphite, cedar, metal, and rubber. But if you had all the elements of a pencil right in front of you, could you make a pencil? It's not as easy as you might think. In fact, no single person on the face of the earth could do it without the help of countless others. And this is the key to understanding the world. A pencil, just like you and me, is the end result of a vast and intricate family tree, a symphony of human activity that spans the globe. Through their work and knowledge, a vast number of people have had a hand in making this simple pencil. Unlike your family tree, this one begins with an actual tree. The most immediate ancestor of the pencil is a cedar tree in the Pacific Northwest. But the loggers who harvest the timber are also its ancestors. And these men don't work alone. They, in turn, are assisted by the people and industries that produce the saws, rope, and countless other tools that they use. These are also the ancestors of our pencil. As is the waitress at a nearby diner who sells the loggers lunch, to say nothing of the thousands of people involved in producing that simple midday meal. Across time and space, the web grows. Consider the roads, trucks, ships, communication systems, and the people who design, build, and maintain them. All of them are necessary to bring the lumber to the mills and the slat factories that process them. All of them are also the ancestors of the pencil. And even with the work of all these people, so far all we have is a stained wooden slat, a naked half of a wooden body of a pencil. But its family tree is larger and more extensive. The graphite is mined in China and Sri Lanka. At the pencil factory, it's mixed with clay and heat and other materials before it's extruded, dried, and baked in a kiln. People from different continents, different cultures, cooperate to bring these materials together with waxes and kilns and equipment from across the world. These, too, are the ancestors of the pencil. And the same is true of the eraser. With ingredients from around the world, it's the end result of a similarly complex and exotic branch of the family tree. As is the ferrule, the metal band made from material that is mined, refined, and shipped from all over the world. Each part of the pencil is the result of the collaboration and cooperation of millions of people. Together, they form a process that is constantly changing and adapting. A change in the availability or cost of material from one place might make another source more desirable, and the process changes and adapts fluidly. And there is a fact that's still more astounding. The absence of a mastermind, of anyone dictating these countless actions which bring a pencil into being. Each member of this family tree supplies only a small amount of the necessary know-how needed to make a pencil. They do so voluntarily, not because they necessarily want pencils or like pencils, but because by working to create them, they exchange their labor and skills for the wages that let them buy what they want and need. What you're seeing is the market at work. The spontaneous configuration of creative human energies, of millions of people with their various skills and talents, organizing voluntarily in response to human necessity and desire, as if led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of the intention. Every second we are alive, we benefit from the products of voluntary, spontaneous cooperation. This is the modern world. It's miraculous, it's intricate, and it gets better every day, so long as people are free to interact with each other. If we can leave the creative energies of humankind uninhibited, there's no limit to what we can accomplish.